We'll talk about cities and we'll talk about how we can make uh, cities sustainable or can make big cities actually work. Uh, my name is Ludwig Siegler. I work for The Economist, uh, that uh, little newspaper from London. Um, and uh, you may actually wonder why uh, the organizers of this conference have actually put a uh, panel on cities uh, uh, on this program of a tech conference. I mean, cities are not necessarily associated with tech. And the answer is quite simple. I mean, you all know that more than 50% of people now live in cities. Um, and even in China, uh, more than 50% of people now live in cities, which is quite an achievement in a country where I think the, the, the Communist Party rose uh, uh, by mobilizing the peasantry and then kind of encircling the cities now. Uh, so cities are growing, cities are growing bigger and bigger. Right now, I think we have 20 or 24 mega cities, meaning cities with more than 10 million people. And I just had a chat with uh, Carlo, who is on the panel, and tells me that theoretically, if you do some fancy math, uh, the biggest city may be 200 million. So and the only way to make uh, uh, such a big city work is actually with technology, uh, with data, with computers, with smart grids, all of that. And that's, that's why this panel is, is, is uh, uh, the DLD has a cities panel. And the great thing about this panel is that we have actually people from very, very different backgrounds uh, talking about this. We have um, uh, Pedro Miranda, who works for Siemens, Siemens One. Siemens One is, uh, uh, sells basically big packages, solutions to city to make, make them smarter. We have uh, Hillary Mason. Hillary is the, the chief scientist of Bitly. And uh, you, of course, all know Bitly because it shortens uh, links, but the most important thing, I was told, and that's how I, should, uh, I was supposed to kind of introduce her, Bitly actually allows you to measure in real time or see in real time what people are interested in. And Hillary also uh, has started a nonprofit organization in New York, Hack and Why. And Hack and Why is uh, a kind of thinks of itself as an intermediary between uh, people, startups, I mean, clever people, startups, uh, uh, and jobs, and uh, trying to kind of get people. Uh, uh, whatever, people from students to, to uh, sign up for startups rather than financial institutions or, or big companies. Got that right. Then we have the architect here, Edwin Chan. Edwin uh, was or still is a partner of uh, Gary Partners, famous architecture bureau, and he's going to open his own uh, practice soon, he's just told me. Right now you work for the Louis Vuitton Foundation, and you're certainly going to tell us what, what you do there. And finally, on the panel, we have Carlo Ratti. And uh, it's a bit difficult to introduce Carlo Ratti because Carlo does so many things. But he directs uh, the Sensible City Lab at MIT. And uh, that is, and I'm going to get this wrong, I guess, it's basically using all the data that is produced by a city, be it uh, using data from cell phones, uh, cell phone networks, uh, other sensor networks, and see what actually happens in, in, in a city. Um, I think we're going to start this out with the first round uh, by actually setting, kind of uh, defining what we're going to talk about. So, um, Pedro, if, if you could tell me how you actually define a sustainable city and what, what Siemens does, uh, what you're trying to do to kind of further that goal. Well, uh, I think most of the cities uh, are all different from each other, but they have three very important traits which you can uh, put as the common denominator. So, first of all, um, they have to be sustainable in the future. That means everything that you do in a city has to be proven resilient in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So we are not in age anymore to make decisions in cities which are only uh, short-sighted. So it's very important to think ahead and to think about sustainable ways to develop cities. The second part, which is uh, quite important, is the environmental sustainability. That means we are all concerned about the CO2 footprint, the air pollution, air quality, this is very important. People are very sensitive and they like to live in cities which are clean and green. And of course, if you go to South America, if you go to North America, if you go to Middle East, Asia, you find many different levels of maturity in terms of air control, uh, quality control of, of the air. For example, in Mexico City, the pollution very still very present, although they have made many good progresses in the last years. And if you go to Munich, for example, it's one of the best uh, indexes on air quality. So I think we have also to gauge on all the cities what are, let's say, the most important levers to make those more sustainable. 
And of course, uh, what is important also is that technology plays here a very important role. That means uh, the decision makers have a budget to develop the cities, but money is not elastic. So you, make, you have to make priorities. And these priorities are usually very much into uh, the level of political decision, but also citizens' uh, decision. More and more, governance of cities is where people are trying to say, we want this and we do not want that. So I think a combination of these factors make the sustainable approach to cities very important. But you're also in charge of uh, the Center of Competence Cities in London. Yes. Uh, can you tell me more and can you kind of explain perhaps, taking the example of London, how, how sustainable London is or what you could do to make it more sustainable? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, we are building a sustainable center in, in London for Siemens worldwide. Uh, this is a, a unique building which is going to be, uh, it's being constructed right now in the Victoria Docklands, in the east part of London, in the green city in the, uh, the district of London where we plan to have all the urban planners and architects and scientists also promoting uh, solutions which are sustainable. So in London there are, you know, we could choose other cities, but if you ask me about London, we have three examples where we were very successful in, uh, let's say, bringing the difference. One of them is bringing less cars inside the city. It was a decision from the mayor of London to bring less cars inside the city. And how can you do that? you can stop the cars to come in or you can charge them. So you cannot actually stop cars from coming inside the city. So the idea was to find a system where you could charge each and every car when they came in into, the, let's say, the working hours. And this is done through a technology which zooms on the, on the car plate, recollects the, the number on the, on, the, on the car plate, makes a match with the database inside the city of London, which is registered, and, and then is automatic built to the user which goes with the car inside London. If you do not pre-register, or if you are not, let's say, you get the fine, because this is also, we have the database of all the p potential number plates in London. And what happened is that we have decreased, well, when I say we, it's London, we have decreased in 30% the amount of cars which move inside of London. So with uh, an, an a very efficient, let's say, decrease on CO2 uh, abatement curves. And secondly, all the public transportation, like Transport for London in the um, subway and also um, trains, have increased tremendously. So we, this is an example how technology can help to stop, uh, let's say, pollution inside the, uh, the city with less emissions of CO2, but also promote the investments which are public. And in, by the way, uh, if you are in London, you never take a car inside London. You always take the tube or an alternative uh, type of transportation. Only the people that really need the car, be it logistics or be it very specific uh, issues, go in now inside of London. So that's an example. A second example is also the transportation. You know, mobility is very important between airports and the center of city. Uh, if you come from, uh, from Munich, in the airport of, of Munich, you can take a taxi, but most people, if they cross about 500, 600 meters, they can also take the, the train directly to open off. So the important thing is to give the choice to the people. And we had, uh, let's say, many, many investments uh, between um, the airports and the three airports of London to make sure that people have an alternative on using, um, let's say, the cleanest way to travel, which is by train. So that's some examples. Thank you. Edwin, I mean, you as an architect, when, when, when you start to design a building, I mean, is, is, is sustainability an important consideration? Um, well, I uh, have to say that, um, first of all, I'm a little very excited to be here <laughs> and a little bit overwhelmed by the, um, the high level of expertise in my, in my company here. But uh, so my... Uh, when I think about architecture, I suppose what we do um, is we, because we're just architects, so in that sense, I don't think that we start from, from the larger picture. We think of architecture as the building blocks, as the small steps uh, in terms of the DNAs of a larger kind of environment, which is the city. And so all we do is to try to um, make 
uh, our buildings as good as we can, I suppose. And hopefully we make a good work of architecture. Historically, I believe that all good architecture is sustainable in that sense. Now, the thing is what we do, I think nowadays with the abundance of, of technology at our disposal, I think very, uh, there's a trend I think in architecture that we call, um, we label it as sort of greenwashing. So, and so we say that, you know, for example, everybody in California, you can be LEED certified, but all the LEED certified buildings are not necessarily uh, good buildings. And sometimes, you know, I think technology has a way of distracting us from perhaps the more valuable things and common sense. Um, a few years ago, I had the privilege of, say, working on a building uh, in Switzerland, in Basel, for a pharmaceutical company called uh, Novartis. It's uh, an energy, it's a zero energy building. So I'm very proud to have been a part of that creative process. But the thing is, for inspiration on that building, we were just looking at, for example, the um, uh, the Indian teepees, because in some ways, if you look at history, uh, you can actually discover uh, a lot of uh, environmentally friendly strategies is already embedded in our, the DNAs of our humanity. And if you, the Indian teepee is a very logical way for the air to circulate. And in the old days, they didn't have all the photovoltaic cells and all that stuff to make the environment sustainable. So we adapted that strategy into our building and we made a 21st century uh, sustainable building that doesn't look like a sustainable building. Too bad I don't have an image to share with you, but if you Google it, you may see that building. You wouldn't think of that building as a zero energy building, but it is. And, and, and the people in there, more importantly, we have to remember that the people in there, when you live in an environment that you're comfortable, that is a good design, first of all, um, they're happy. We're doing this at the service of making people uh, a good experience. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is I think um, in our society and say in the construction industry specifically, which is you know, what we're involved with as architects, there is, uh, I would say that we're in the society in the value of uh, excess that everything is in abundance, especially in the US. You can see people kind of drive long distances to go to work, they, you know, they have to live in these big houses and so on and so forth just because they thought that they can. And the reality is, of course, um, the value have changed now. And, and I think it's, it's perhaps um, a good time for us as professionals to think about how to manage the waste that we've created, uh, especially in con construction industry. Uh, I think some studies I read said that in the building industry, in the environment, I think about, say, uh, close to 30% of natural resources has gone to waste. And that is a result of, say, uh, changes that architects or clients make during the process, inefficient communication, or the lack of uh, knowledge about uh, quantity that is required to uh, make a building. So I think. Uh, with the technology that we have now available that allows us to communicate um, in a much more direct way between architects and contractors and the people who make our environment. Also, the technology in the computer modeling that allows us to take accurate information about what we do and, and, and how this gets translated to uh, the contractors and fabricators, we should be able to reduce this amount of waste. And I think that is a very high priority, to use technology as a way to uh, empower the direct communication between the different people involved in the construction industry. And again, it's uh, for the service of creating uh, a better, uh, reducing the, the amount of excess and finding the essence of, say, what we do uh, as architect, uh, because that's ultimately, in my definition, is good design. Um, and then finally, something a little bit uh, less quantifiable, less technological, less scientific, which is we shouldn't forget that all of this, it's, it's about you know, reintroducing a sense of, say, value to uh, our built environment, to our society, because we want to create places that people can be proud of. And I think that you know, creating sustainable city, in the end, for me, the way to define a sustainable city is a place that actually uh, 
makes the citizens happy to be in, and we create a place where people can, where arts and culture uh, can flourish, and and um, and technology is at the way is in the service of all of that. Um, um, that's maybe all I have to say so far. We can talk about it some more later. Hillary, I think. You, if, if, if Edwin, one could kind of describe your approach as more like intuitive driven, and your approach, Hillary, is more data driven. And I should add, I forgot when I introduced you to say that you're also an advisor to, to Mayor Bloomberg in New York, uh, how to make uh, New York more a digital city or create a platform as a city. Perhaps you kind of can walk me through what that means in the case of New York. How can you use data to, to make New York more sustainable? Sure. The, uh, so, hi everybody, I'm Hillary. I'm a computer scientist, and I actually would like to point the room's attention to the sign at the back of the room. Uh, it's also a good opportunity to stretch. You've been sitting down for a while. It says, <laughs> all you need is data. Um, and I, I actually disagree with that word of statement. Um, data is one piece of what you need. Uh, you also need creativity. You need to understand the problem you're trying to solve. That's usually the hardest part. And then you need some infrastructure on which you can operate with your data in order to come to some conclusion. And that infrastructure can be computational infrastructure or it can be the physicality of a city. Um, and so I, I have, I think, two perspectives that might be worth offering here. The first one is through my work at Bitly. We see what people share online in real time and we try and understand that. And so to us, uh, we can redraw the world map just by what links people are looking at on the internet. Um, and I'm happy to show anyone a demo of that if they'd like to see it later. Uh, we can also see how someone's physical location alters the information they view. And so to me, a city is a physical place, but it's also a place in which information flows through. And we can manipulate that information in order to make people's experience more optimal. Uh, and examples of that kind of information, um, given that it's the internet, are things like uh, this morning when I looked, for example, uh, Justin Bieber was not the most popular celebrity in Germany. Um, it was Lady Gaga. 3% um, of all clicks on links last year in 2011 went to pages about that top 100 celebrities, if you want a really either exciting or depressing statistic. Um, just the top 100. And, and then uh, uh, several other percent went to kittens. Um, to what? So the second perspective uh, is more on the, the human side of building structures in cities. And uh, that's where um, the work with Mayor Bloomberg on his technology advisory board and also my work with Hack NY, which is a nonprofit we built in New York, comes into play. There we took a very computational approach to identifying the different perspectives that had value in a community um, and in a city, understanding the levers that we could pull and things that we could change, um, and finally use that to hopefully uh, come up with a long-term strategy for growth of the community. And in this, this sense, I think the community is the city. It's the people in the city, um, particularly in New York, the technology community. Uh, and so some examples of the work there were this organization we created that acts as a structure where it funnels students into the technology community, works with startups. It's funded by venture capitalists and other interested parties who would like to connect those things together and supported by government. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg's administration also uh, has set aside $100 million to bring uh, the Technion and Cornell University to Roosevelt Island, just east of Manhattan which I think will change the, the nature of that technology community uh, immensely. And also, if the government is going to spend $100 million in the city, it is well invested in education. Definitely, but, but t tell me, I mean, how can I, the, the, you, the data you kind of gather and analyze at Bitly, how can I use that, for example, to optimize a city or make it work better? I mean, can you, can you give me any kind of a concrete example, even if, it, it, I mean, and not just infrastructure. I mean, you define city, obviously, a bit, bit wider, uh, but, what, but how can I use that data to, to make things better? And it, it depends a lot on what the problems are that you face, but one example that I like to share is that during the Occupy Wall Street protests when uh, UC Davis students were peacefully protesting and being sprayed with pepper spray, if you looked in New York at the top content people were reading, it was the New York Times and Gotham as coverage of the Occupy Wall Street protests. If you went to California and looked at what people were reading, it was what the hell do I do if I've been sprayed with pepper spray? Right? And so just from that data flow, we understand that something fairly significant has happened in that community. 
Um, and then it falls to us to find better ways to disseminate that kinds of useful information. And, and one kind of term that pops up in kind of when people talk about New York as a, as a digital, digital city is, is platform, a city as a platform. I mean, could you walk me through that and, and tell me what, what uh, New York has done kind of to create that, that platform? Uh, so the New York tech community is great. Do we have New Yorkers in the audience, actually? All right. Um, and it, in fact, the, uh, the tension with the California tech community has been a wonderful thing to us because it means that instead of competing with each other, we've sort of come together uh, to support each other. And so there are things uh, like the Made in New York branding. There's a, a what you can Google it, Made in NYC. Uh, New York City startups, meaning things that are coded, uh, created in New York, put this brand on their website. We have it at Bitly, you can also find it at Foursquare and several other, hundred other companies. Um, and that's one community effort where somebody said, hey, we need to do this to support each other. Okay. Carlo, no, I mean, he, uh, Hillary kind of takes unstructured data, or that's part of the story. I mean, you, you use structured data to kind of tell us what, what happens in, 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 in a community, in a city. Um, and in, in particular, you, you, you have this project in Singapore. Can we get that? Yes. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah, it's working. I mean, w I mean, w what what can you kind of in a, in a city like Singapore, which actually is working quite well? I mean, w what role does 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 do projects like yours yours play actually? Yeah. Well, well. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Great pleasure to be here as well. Um, I I really agree with what you, Hillary was saying just now. Um, if you just want to think about the metaphor. Um, of what is happening in cities. Think about what happened in Formula One. Now, in 20 years ago, if you wanted to win a Formula One race, what you needed was a good car and a good driver. Take a good budget, you'd bet it on the car, you needed the mechanics, the physical things, and then you could win the race. Now, as we all know, today if you want to win a Formula One race, actually what you need is something different. It is something that's a telemetry system, a system with thousands and thousands of sensors onto the car, collecting information in real time, analyzing that information and making decisions that will help you to win the race. And uh, so that's a big change that, uh, uh, you know, it happened in Formula One in many, many other fields. It's uh, kind of creating real time control systems. And what we believe is, uh, is very interesting, very unique today is that our cities, for the first time, are starting to behave like real time control systems. So we got all this data that we just heard about, that we can collect from the city, we can analyze the data, understand what's going on, and then respond to that. Which is really, if you want, it's, uh, it's um, what we do all the time as living or dynamic systems. You know, when we meet each other, it's really collect information and then respond to that. It's the sensing and actuation loop, which is what, what, what every dynamic system does. So that is kind of the framework um, of our group at MIT called Sensible City Lab. We are mostly based at MIT, around 30 people, and then a new lab now in Singapore. And really try to get new type, new sources of data for understanding the city, and then responding to that, understanding how the city can respond to that. And um, going back to your Singapore project, well, Singapore is one example where we actually, the lab in Singapore is collecting large amount of real-time data, data from data about energy consumption, pollution, taxis, buses, incoming goods, outcoming flows, uh, you know, people, and using that as an open source platform to share with the citizens. Like, think about open data, but open real-time data. So sharing this data in real time with the population, just starting the project, and, you know, and seeing what happens, almost if you had a kind of streaming web. Um, Can you give an example? I mean Traffic control in Singapore or... European. Yeah, you know, when, when you have that, then you have all the traditional optimization things you can do. So you can actually think about a city where traffic works better. Uh, you know, one thing that has been uh, tested in Singapore is you got all the taxes and uh, you got the position in real time about rain. Now, in Singapore, it rains in patches. And when it rains, it's impossible to find a taxi, for instance. So when you combine that information, actually, you, get, you can optimize the system and, and for users and for taxi drivers as well. Um, these are, there's many examples, and this is really a kind of optimization view of the city. However, I wanted to mention that there is something that I find uh, um, very exciting, probably even more exciting, when you think about the real-time control loop, and that is when all of this happens not in a centralized way, but actually in a distributed, bottom-up way. So in a certain sense, I think uh, one of the best examples of smart cities, perhaps, 
from the past 12 months is maybe Cairo, where actually people use the technologies in order to enforce and build a real-time control loop that promoted incredible change that would not have been possible without those technologies. Thanks. Pedro, you, you mentioned uh, um, the car, and uh, I want to push you on that a bit. Is, is, do you think that as, as cities become bigger and bigger, they basically will become em empty, but there will be no cars in, 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 uh, in cities? Is, or, not a lot. I mean, is, is that kind of the thinking at Siemens that, that uh, the city of the future is actually, or the big city of the future is, is the carless city? Well, well, that is definitely a convergence uh, in all the cities to restrict cars to go in the center. That's, uh, that's a common denominator. There is also a trend that uh, people want to use uh, green cars. So that's not something that is imposed. They ask for it. Although I have to say, I would expect this to be already in a much more developed stage. You know, if you look at all the mature cities that we have around the world, very, very few electrical cars are available. And one of the most important points why this happens is because there is not an electrical charging infrastructure. So people are afraid to take out an electrical car and then they say, when, when am I going to charge a car? And this Apparently, it's a small problem, but it's a very difficult problem to solve from the technology point of view, because most cities are very complex in the way they are built, you know, the infrastructure beneath the, the, the level of the buildings. So it's very difficult to implement, uh, let's say, electrical charge uh, systems. Uh, we are planning in Siemens to do what we call Source London. It's, again, an example for London, uh, where we plan to install 1,300 electric chargers in the center of, of the city of London. So first of all, there is, has to be two efforts. One, from the infrastructure point of view, to make sure that this electricity is available to charge electrical cars. And secondly, there is, we have to have also from the automotive industry, a threshold of uh, a new paradigm where more cars are available with electrical charging uh, devices. If you compare Europe with Asia, you could see that in China, everything is going much faster because most of the cities are not mature. They are most of them uh, greenfield cities. So that means they are completely new to set up this type of infrastructure. So our provision is that in China will be by far the, the country in the world with more electrical vehicles in the next 10, 20 years. And it will be very difficult for Europe to catch up so we'll have, let's say, different types of level of utilization. I would like to make a comment not only about cars, uh, just to finish my, my idea, is that we have to change basically our uh, consumption uh, characteristics or patterns. And this is something that we have to do an effort as uh, thinkers of the future to teach people or to give them data for them to decide. And it's not all about uh, smart uh, production or smart transmission of electricity, because this is for the stakeholders of the big, uh, let's say, enterprises which generate and transmit. But on the smart consumption, there has to be more data for people in their iPads or in their mobile devices or their internet for them to know the cost of electricity, what do they save on CO2 uh, emissions, how can they change their own environment of electricity usage? Because we are really talking about going from a population right now of 6.5 billion people to 9 billion people in the short term of 20, 30 years. So we have to change our, you know, even if we don't want to see it, we, the ones that don't want to see it, they will suffer the most. And example again, China and Asia, it's very developed on those concepts because they have the most urgent problems. So I would say a combination of technology, but also of characteristics of how we consume energy in the cities. That's, that's actually a good segue, uh, so we can talk about something, uh, kind of last point before I, I open it up to, to the audience, and that is governance. I mean, changing behavior, changing technology, but also changing governments. I mean, the, the, the way cities are run. And I mean, there's a reason why Singapore is actually a very good <laughs> example. But we, of course, with disadvantages, but uh, there's also a reason why a city like Mumbai isn't so well run. Uh, and one thing which I found intriguing talking to uh, Hillary preparing this panel is, is so you have this approach of using algorithms actually to design organizations. I mean, your NGO is one example, but you could of course do that for cities as well. Certainly. Um, hello? Oh, 
It's not, uh, not something that I have much experience with, but I think it's particularly fascinating um, that cities can be, as the data becomes available and the capacity to analyze it becomes available, we're currently stuck at the third step, which is developing the algorithms to understand in a rigorous way um, with an appreciation of likely error uh, what that data actually means. Uh, and then the next step, once we've solved this, is to build our cities such that they are responsive in real time to that data. And I, I do think we'll see a lot of interesting work around that, particularly in the next 30 years. And I think, Carl, you had an idea about kind of how you can get citizens involved in, 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 in coming up with their kind of sustainable city. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, if you think about this real-time feedback loop and how people really, how all of us, can really play a role in that, in responding, in becoming the kind of intelligent actuators of the city. Well, there seems as today, we've seen a lot of changes this year, you know, what we saw in the Arab world, what we saw with several, with the Occupy movement and so on, um, really has shown a new way to use technologies on, in order to make decisions. So one thing that we, we're actually starting today with DLD, that will continue at uh, DLD City um, later this year, uh, is, uh, you know, can we think about, you know, all in the past, this is really a big change in the, in, it's almost like a devolution, not from nation states to cities, but to, to citizens, all the way down. And uh, in the past, every time something like this happened, people have actually thought about it and started thinking about a charter of rights and, you know, re redefining kind of the rights and the, and the conditions. Um, so, so we said, well, you know, maybe it's a, we should do something like that, like a, kind of charter for new citizenship. And there's a website, there's a Wikipedia, Wikipedia site that's on since today, uh, that's actually called New Citizenship, uh, where every, each of you is invited to start contributing about what could be, what could be the main uh, rights and ideas based on what we've seen over the past 12 months about citizenship and being in a city and, uh, and uh, making decisions there, taking more responsibility. And the idea is that this process that will, will itself be done in a kind of bottom-up collaborative way will then lead to this charter that will end up at uh, DLD cities in, uh, in a few months. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, Wikipedia and new citizenship as a page. Great, great call. So, so it's uh, time for questions. We have five minutes. Um, so who wants to be the first one? And, and please tell me who you are, who you work for. Hi, David Langer from Group Spaces. So the question is um, kind of flipping this on its head. Um, one of the things that um, data and understanding it allows us to do is um, reducing a lot of jobs in cities. So for example, you, know, you don't need someone at the checkout anymore. You can just scan your goods yourself and pay for them. Google's working on self-driving cars, which will remove the need for that. And data can make things more efficient in, in many other places, which on the one hand is great. On the other hand, can, you know, moving forwards 50 or 100 years, cause potentially very, very high levels of unemployment in cities, which can cause other problems, making them unsustainable. How do you, do you see data making that, uh, yeah, helping with that situation, or how do you see us addressing that? Who wants to take that? Carlo. I can say a few words on that. I, I think actually uh, what you're describing is that as technical progress increases, there's an increasing gap between uh, the number of people who are employed, essentially technology is, is replacing human workers at an increasing rate. Um, and I don't know that this is tied necessarily to cities. I think in fact you'll find that cities are where more of the creative work happens um, and that it, it will have a greater impact outside of cities uh, where you don't have that concentration of people who are sort of orchestrating that sort of technical development. Um, I don't have an answer for you on that, but I, I do think this kind of progress is inevitable and that it is up to the people designing technology to keep in mind the points at which human interaction is necessary, uh, both to, um, you know, to maintain a, a civil society, but also to make sure that you know, technology and algorithms are very poor for making moral decisions. Uh, and I can tell you a few stories about algorithms that have run away and gone a little bit wild um, to their detriment. I and mean, we still need to have a, a human in there somewhere. Um, no. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> Technology. Um, but, um, but, you know, in the end, what would remain still, even 50, 100 years, as you say, is still the most fun stuff. So all of the creative part, all of the thinking behind, which is, which is in the end, the real progress. The other thing is, you know, what you are getting rid of is, is a lot of repetitive stuff. So I think, you know, I think it's an optimistic view. Uh, maybe just a, a comment. What we have found is that the migration from the rural areas to the cities, which occurs not in Europe, but in Asia and Latin America, puts a lot of pressure on jobs, on existing jobs, because people want to move in the city because they, have, they can find education, they can find uh, good uh, hospitals, and also a safe environment, uh, more stable. So I think we have, let's say, a dilemma. How can we stop so many people to go from the rural areas to the cities? So we ha the society has to be intelligent how to balance these two things, because if we keep pouring people inside cities without any structure, balance uh, of life, then we have a huge problem. And I think this is one of the big question marks is about the sustainable cities. How can we so fix that? So it's not a clear answer to you, uh, but I would say there is something for us, which are the front thinkers of these uh, topics. How can we manage that in the future? Let, let me put, uh, put that question also to Edwin. I mean, with your kind of more intuitive-driven approach, I mean, does that frighten you that that data uh, seems to be becoming the new god? No. No, I. I, I can see it's just my phone. I think that's the answer. I drop my phone. <laughs> um, no, I think. Um, but I think the. But like what I was saying earlier, I think. It's great that we live in the time now that we have all the technologies at our disposal. And, and, but the thing is we have to remember the data is there for us to use, right? So it's a question of how we use it. I was very intrigued by you know, Pedro's last comment. In the end, I think it points out to the fact that we're trying to make our city sustainable because we want to make it a better place for all of us to be in. And, and I think that is the ultimate priority, is that a sustainable city, in my view, is not about all the technology and all that stuff. That's a way for us to accomplish this goal, which is the city maintains its value as a place for our humanity to flourish. I think that's the goal. I think we have time for one more question. Over there. I just have one little question. How can we use the word sustainability for things which are not? Because architecture is maybe doing everything to be sustainable in terms of uh, the energy we're using, but what about the, the architecture of the building itself, which is not sustainable? Or like the cars, you're doing, trying to do cities clean with uh, clean energy, and that the cars themselves are not sustainable. In terms of architecture, I give you the answer for that. No, I, I? But I, you know, there's, um, there's, um, it's an interesting question. But um, I believe the cities uh, are more the solution than the problem. There's some very interesting work that was done by Jeffrey West, who was actually here last year. He looked at cities, and so the cities, you take a city, you take a city size, and then you double the size, and then some things actually grow super linearly. So efficiency of the city grows more than the size, while the energy consumption grows less than the size. So they say in physics, one thing grows super linearly, one, one thing grows sublinearly. So basically, when you actually go from something that's sprawl or that's, uh, you know, that's not dense to something that's denser, you actually can save resources. So in a certain sense, you know, given the fact that uh, if you take into account the fact that uh, you, know, you will have a certain population with basic needs, and that, uh, that means using resources, actually the city itself, and especially a compact city and the larger city, seems to be a way to be more efficient and use less resources. So, you know, of course, still there's resources, but uh, it's a way to, it's, it's part of the solution to, to save more. Uh, than what you would do in another situation. So that's my answer to, to part of the question. Um, very well. I think also very important for buildings is the re resilience of the building. That means, does it stay uh, on a usable uh, platform for the next 20 years or not? Or is something for the next five years and that's it? So it's very important that the, the urban planners and the architects build something which is resilient 
and will endure more than 20, 10, 20, 30 years. One, one of the examples here in Munich is that most of the, let's say, nice buildings around this quartier, they are over 50 years. And they have been renovated every two, three years to keep this uh, impeccable facade. And this is a part of the sustainability of the city. The, the other part is to bring energy efficiency inside those uh, urban developments. You know, we have, uh, like you said just a while ago, we have the LEED certification, which is a very well-known energy efficiency certification, but we have also the BREEAM certification, which has to do with the, the environmental method assessment. And between the LEED and the BREEAM, we can build really buildings which are very sustainable and also very resilient. So let's keep to the norms and let's have also more standardization. So this is one of the things, if you go between the US and Europe, we are always fighting about the, the standard codes. I think it's a convergence that now that everybody understands that this lead and these BREAM specs bring a lot of uh, power to the sustainability answer for cities. Well, thank you. We've run out of time. Thanks a lot. I found that fascinating. I hope you did too. Thanks to the panel. And yeah, let's talk again about cities next time. Thank you.